Hey everybody, welcome to my channel. Today I just thought I'd take a little moment to give you a little background information on myself and who I am and uh, how it was that um, I came to uh, the conclusions that I've come to and how it was that uh, I came to learn what I now know about the uh, scriptures and the apocryphal writings. Um, one of the things that happened to me, um, Back when I was in high school, back when I was in college, I used to be an atheist. I used to be someone who didn't like religion, didn't like the notion of God. I believed in chance. I believed in evolution. Um, I believed that um, that God and the whole afterlife thing and everything, that that was just wishful thinking on the part of, of people. They wanted to live in a perfect world. They didn't want to die. And that was just something that cultures all around the world, they came up with religion to deal with issues of evil and of death, because you lived in a world where, of course, evil and death were involved. And for years and years and years, I felt this way, and I believed this way. In fact, uh, people who knew me way back in the day could tell you that I was kind of in your face about um, religion and how ridiculous I thought it was. Um, because I did think it was ridiculous, and I thought that why live in denial of the truth? You know, if there's death, there's death. Just face it full on. You know, live your life the way um, the way you believe is right. Do what you believe is is right and good and all that, and that's enough. That uh, you know, you live twenty, forty, sixty, eighty years, well, however much you live, just live it to the best of your ability. Death and sickness and evil and all of that, just inherent in life. You did what you could to avoid it. Um, and that was it. And that uh, to teach people that there was an afterlife and all of that, that that was uh, deceptive. And uh, it just wasn't the kind of thing that, that was healthy. It was, uh, it was a way of promoting what isn't over what what is. And um, anyway, so all throughout my high school and college years, I was kind of of this notion. However, there were things that were happening to me in my life. Um, things that were just too coincidental really to be believed. Um, I wouldn't have believed them if people had told me that these things had happened to them, but since they were happening to me, and they were happening to me in such a way that I couldn't explain it, that, that I felt that somehow and on some level that some truth somehow, some way was trying to um, reveal itself to me, um, and that uh, things in my life were just too... Uh, too coincidental to merely be chance. And so I did have my beliefs sort of challenged by, um, by my experiences. Uh, and eventually I came to, to accept the fact that something somewhere was shaping events in my life. Um, and uh, anyway, long story short, um, at the time that I started becoming more and more open to God and to the truth, Again, because of things that were happening in my life that were really too coincidental to be ex uh, explained, um, I just happened to be working with this Baptist minister who uh, um, invited me to his home um, for dinner and for Bible study. And because I was sort of thinking it at the time and we had had a few minor discussions about it, um, he invited me to his home and, and for dinner. And, of course, we went. And... Um, after the dinner, you know, we had a little bit of Bible study, and he told me a little bit about um, how, you know, um, believing in the Bible was one thing, but giving your life over to Jesus was something else. And that was something that I had sort of vaguely heard of, but I hadn't quite uh, internalized that yet. I, I wasn't ready, I guess, to uh, take that step. So uh, he and his wife started, uh, you know, praying. They asked if they mind if, you know, we said a little prayer. And, of course, I didn't, I didn't mind. I didn't object. Uh, they had invited me into their home, after all. They had, uh, they had fed me, right? They had uh, spent some time teaching me. And, uh, you know, I was sort of opening up to the idea that there was a God. And, um, you know, and, and then the, the religion that I had been exposed to, most of all, was Christianity. And that was one I understood, if not, if not well, uh, that I understood it somewhat, uh, and they began leading me through the sinner's prayer. And, um, you know, so, you know, he had told me about how to bend the knee of my heart, 
if you will, to Jesus and to accept him into my life. And, and, and at the time, I can remember thinking, well, you know, things were happening to me in my life that I couldn't explain. And maybe that was the spirit. Maybe that was God acting in my life. And so if there was a way to walk in that, if there was a way to live in that, my rational thinking was that, you know, I should have that in my life, that I should be transform. But as I was saying the sinner's prayer, I remember I, I, I couldn't quite do it. Just at the point where I asked Jesus into my heart and to guide me, you know, in my life and, and to take my life um, and take him into my life, I couldn't do it. Um, I was unable to speak the words. And I remember, I remember his wife just interceding and interceding, you know, please, Jesus, you know, you know, allow him to speak the words. And I remember there almost being a, a battle inside of me, you know, where I just, I couldn't do it. And then finally, I, I, I finally said the words. I finally mouthed the words because I really, really wanted to. And, and it just did. It was welling up inside of me. And I felt like I had to fight this battle within myself in order to do that. But when that finally the dam broke and finally the words came out, I felt completely different. I felt completely changed and I felt completely transformed. And, and I was in awe of the way in which I had changed and, and what it was that I felt like I had become. It was something I had never felt before. It was something I had never experienced before. So at that point, I was, uh, I was very serious about being saved. I was very serious about reading the Bible. I was very serious about um, getting into the scriptures and just seeing just where this new way of life would take me. So I started going to church and reading the Bible. And uh, this time I was a little more systematic about it. Um, I, uh, I started from the beginning and I started reading my way through, just sort of plowing my way through the Old Testament. Probably if I had it to do over again, I probably would have started with the New Testament. But be that as it may, I start out with the Old Testament. And I started um, reading in Deuteronomy uh, about God's dietary laws. And a lot of this stuff just didn't make sense to me. I was like, what is this telling me? What does this mean to me? And I can remember asking myself this question. It was... Uh, it was a nice, beautiful morning, and, uh, you know, I was feeling kind of, you know, philosophical at the time. And anyway, later on, um, I went out, and we one of the places we went to was a bookstore. And I happened to pick up a book. It was this book, The Lost Books of the Bible. And I just flat out, straight up, opened the page. And when I looked at it, the first word I saw was uh, Deuteronomy right here, you know. And I thought, huh, that's very interesting. And so I started reading around it, and um, it was in the uh, epistle of Barnabas. And I thought, oh, that's very strange. Why would I open right up to um, this particular word? And so I started scanning the passages around it. And, and sure enough, it contained basically what amounted to the answer to my question. And I thought, oh, that was very strange, because here are these books. These books were rejected by the early church fathers. I... I had heard just a little bit about this, but I hadn't really read any of this stuff. I was kind of afraid to read this stuff because one of the things that um, one of the things that um, that that you kind of feel as a Christian is you 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 don't want to trust books that aren't in the Bible because you assume you suppose that there are, that God kept them out and He probably kept them out because they were inferior or erroneous or spurious and everything you read about these books kind of tells you that that there's something wrong with them so it was hard for me to reconcile in my mind just why it was that I opened up that book but then I thought well you know I might just open up Moby Dick or I might just open up any book and God could work through just any book right so I thought well you know why not just the same thing but I, but I bought it anyway I was a little bit curious about it so I bought it and I started reading it a um, um, little bit here, a little bit there. But I was still, my primary objective was reading through the Bible. Um, and anyway, uh, one of the things that happened was once I got all the way to the book of Jude, which is, of course, near the end, it's the next to the last book before the uh, book of Revelation. 
And um, I had read, of course, the Old Testament by then. And I came across Jude 14 and 15, where it said, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, meaning the infiltrators that he had spoken of in verse 4. Um, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of the saints to execute judgment upon all, and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly which they have ungodly committed and of all the harsh speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him and I followed the footnotes because I remember thinking at the time well that's very interesting but I don't remember reading that in the Old Testament um, so I followed the um, the the, um, the the concordance there was a little verse there directing me to Genesis and where I went to look it up it mentioned Enoch, all right, but it didn't mention that particular prophecy. So that stuck out in my head as something that, where is this guy getting this? Where Where is this coming from? Because it just, because it, somewhere in my head I had this notion that the Bible had just kind of fallen out of the sky. Um, I knew that wasn't quite correct. I knew there had been a canonization process and everything, but I had assumed that this process was um, faithful. And that, um, you know, the New Testament writers had agreed upon which books of the Old Testament were canonical and which ones weren't. And I just assumed that they would not quote from any extra biblical work, because why would they? I mean, there were only so many books that were inspired, right? And all the rest of them were, you know, malarkey, right? They were at least inferior or not nearly so important um, or not genuine. And, um, you know, so it did puzzle me why. And it, I came to find out a little bit later because I did do a little bit of research into it, picking up a few other Bibles. I finally found one that sent me to the book of Enoch. So I heard about the book of Enoch. The first thing I did was I found a way to order it from a bookstore because you can't just go into most Christian bookstores and find this book, even though. Um, outside of the Old Testament, you probably won't find a single book besides the book of Enoch that has as, as many quotations in it in the New Testament or many allusions uh, to it. And sure enough, I open up the book and I read the first chapter. And, and one of the most striking things to me about this book is how it claims to be for the end times. I was, I was amazed by that, um, how it says where... Um, these are the, the words of the blessing of Enoch, uh, wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous who will be living in the day of tribulation when all the wicked and godless are to be removed. And I had, you know, I had been hearing all about the tribulation um, because people at the time there was war going on in the Gulf and people were talking about these are the end times. And you know how people do every time there's any anything. They always think it's the end of the world. And they always freak out about it. And, uh, you know, people were talking about it at the church that I was going to and the Koinoninas and all this other stuff that I was doing. Um, you know, the gatherings that we were having at the time. And people were talking about it. And so to think that I was reading this book that was meant for what I perceived at the time to be sort of our times, right? Um, it kind of uh, blew me away that there was a book that was quoted in the New Testament that had been left out, but that it said that it was for the old time, which implied to me that this book was to be given back to us in the end times. And so that struck me, uh, not only because of that, but it also struck me as strange that Christians did not seem to feel the same way about it as I did. Because one of the very first things that really impressed me about it was that Jude was very frank in his quotation of this book, very bold in his quotation of this book. It was very clear to me that he had used the word prophesied. So apparently he saw this book as prophecy. He had directed it at the people who were infiltrating his church. And he had called him the seventh from Adam. And so looking at all of these facts and being a neophyte, being a new Christian, I was thinking to myself, all of the words of God are pure. All of the words of God are holy and sacred and have to be treated as such. And I felt that 
you know, because I was telling people at the time and they were like, you got to watch it. You got to watch it. You can't be reading these books, you know, or if you read these books, you have to read them with the understanding that they're messed up or that they're fakes or so on and so forth. Then I kept thinking to myself, the Jew did not consider this a fake book. And the more I looked into it, the more I researched it, the more it dawned on me that the people in the New Testament had a vastly different understanding and a vastly different appreciation for these things than the Christians who came after them. And it became clear to me that the Christians who had come after the New Testament writer were going off in a completely different direction. And that it was bad enough that, um, that they weren't uh, acknowledging these books, but in a way they were trying to keep me from reading them. And that bothered me. Because I, I, I thought to myself, why do I want to give the lie to Jude? Why do I want to make, um, make Jude wrong just so that I could be right? And that bothered me on a very deep, visceral level. Uh, I just I could not accept that. Um, and then I later found out um, in my research that um, there was a relationship between the book of Jude and um, the second letter uh, to Peter. And this intrigued me because here was a book. The book of Jude was something of a almost an insignificant book in the New Testament, almost like Philemon or second and third John, just a book that people would tend to just skip over or just give a real sort of casual treatment to. Um, and those kinds of things always, you know, send up an antenna because it's always where people aren't looking. It's always what people aren't taking seriously. That's what you really need to focus on is the stuff that people miss. Kind of like when you study, you don't study the 80, 90 percent that you know. You study the 10, 20 percent that you don't know. You do better, right? Well, I started looking at the things that other people weren't looking at and focusing on the things that other people were dismissing. Because I thought to myself, why are they so dismissive of God's word? Why are they so dismissive of the prophets, the New Testament prophets? How could you just be dismissive? If, if, if Jude, if Peter were sitting with you at dinner at the table and they brought up the subject of Enoch, would you dismiss them if they were there? The only reason that we could be so dismissive of these people was because we sort of by consensus, by mutual agreement, had decided to discount their words. And this to me, again, was very disturbing. You know, as a new Christian, as a neophyte especially, I was very serious about the word. This was my first time around reading it, and uh, it, it, it just bothered me to no end. So I started studying it, and I thought to myself, you know what, I'm going to try and... Um, I'm going to try to collate these two books, Second Peter and Jude. I'm going, to, I'm going to try and see if I put them together and form a, a hypothetical text. Would they make sense together? And so I, I wrote out this, uh, this book, this uh, tract here. And, um, you know, I don't know who I was writing it to. I just wanted it written out. I was writing it more or less for my own satisfaction, but making it available to other people. You know, I printed out you know, several, um, I still have, uh, quite a few of them because people don't want them. Um, but I collated the information and, um, you know, sure enough, the entire letter came together in such a way that it kind of answered the question as to whether or not we should be reading these books. And so if you want to kind of read that document, I have made it available on my website. I'll provide a link. Um, after I had done that, um, again, I was reading the book of Enoch. Um, um, well, basically, one of the things that I did once I started reading these apocryphal books, I started buying more and more volumes of these apocryphal books and reading them. But then I realized that, you know, um, I was more interested in listening to things than I was in reading them because I had, I had a, the way that I was working at the time. I had time to listen to music or to listen to lectures or whatever. And I started reading out the biblical scriptures and the apocryphal scriptures onto tape. And um, basically, I have just tons and tons and tons of this stuff that I read out. 
um, for myself, for my own sake, and I would listen to them just at work and at home and whatever, and I actually have more than this. Carrying it all up here. And I would listen to all of this material, and the more I would listen to it, the more I would notice patterns, the more I would notice keys and clues and they gave me tremendous insights not only into themselves but also into the canonical scriptures and one day I was listening to the book of Enoch and all of a sudden this insight sort of hit me about one of the visions that he was having that it had described um, a black hole um, that uh, the description in it was of a black hole and um, the more I read it, uh, the more I realized that this thing had been described in several different places within the book of Enoch, um, several different chapters, in chapter 18, um, in chapter 21, and in chapter 108. So I did basically the same thing as I did with Second Peter and Jude, how I combined them, I ordered them, I, I copied them, and I cut them out and I placed them in order and sort of collated the material into one big thing and that was very enlightening for me and I took this black hole um, these sections that describe this object and I again I copied them I cut them out and ordered them and placed them together and collated them and then you know it all just it all came together to form an even more coherent and holistic picture of a black hole and so I thought that was very interesting. And I sent copies of this collated material off to several nationwide ministries as well as a few local ministries. Um, and I got basically one response back. And that person simply told me that it wasn't worth the time to even look at it because it had come from an apocryphal source. So this was in, in their mindset was, I don't care what it is. I don't care. That issue has been settled. And they were very dismissive of it. And that was very enlightening to me, too, because I realized just how closed minded people were in the academic and religious communities. Um, not that I wanted to think poorly of them, but it did strike me as strange that I was making an extraordinary claim and I provided them with everything that they needed just to check it out just to see if it was right and to the person they were extremely dismissive of it so it that that told me a lot about the intellectuals and the um the leaders that were out there to this day that they were just as dismissive of this book today as they were back in the early church but jude was not dismissive of this and Peter was not dismissive of Jude. He took that book and thought it important enough to write his entire second letter around it. And people seem to not be curious as to why this happened. And people furthermore don't seem to mind that Jude, instead of following Second Peter, which would be the most logical place for it, that it was buried back after Third John, between Third John and Revelation where people were already basically ignoring and skipping over 2nd and 3rd John, they would just skip over Jude and go right to Revelation. Um, so that seemed a little suspicious to me too. It seemed to, um, it seemed to be telling me that there was, um, there was a deliberate cover-up of this, uh, a cover-up literally of biblical proportions, that these people were so dishonest and so... Uh, against people reading these two books together that they literally separated them in the canon literally with the hopes that no one would ever put the pieces together and that to me just seems so sinister and so diabolical and so evil and yet you ask ministers today you point this out to Christians today and you will find that they have that same attitude they're not open to the truth no matter how you present it to them uh, and you will find that this is the case. This is why I feel like people who are outside of the church, people who are outside of religion, uh, people who are outside of Christianity will find this more enlightening 
than people who are within Christianity and are within tradition. Because frankly, people that are within tradition are either too afraid of truth like this, or they've been brainwashed into thinking that these things could never possibly be, and that tradition is somehow correct, even in the face of Scripture that that shows evidence to the contrary. Now, I wasn't reading the apocryphal books exclusively. I was reading also the canonical books. Um, and um, in the course of listening to the Gospels, um, something popped into my head about Peter representing the church. And um, I started putting the, the pieces together in my mind um, as to well, what if he does. Right, just as sort of working out the um, the math, if you will, because to me parables are a little bit like word problems. Like somebody might give you a mathematical problem in terms of you know words or verbiage, um, and then you come up with an answer based on the information that's given. And I thought parables were kind of like the same way because Jesus explained to us how to interpret parables. And um, he he would use substitution. The seed is the word. The field is the earth. So he'd use substitution. So X equals seed. Y equals the world. You see, and so it was like a word problem. And so I thought to myself, well, why aren't Christians thinking more in terms of interpretation of parables? Because it's all been clearly given to you. It's all been placed before you by none other than Jesus himself, giving you this technique, giving you this insight. Um, and so I put together, um, this, the hidden treasure here, um, about the parables. And in this particular tract, um, I demonstrate to you how the, if you understand that these non-canonical books are the subject of the parables, are great many of them. Um, that you could understand the parables, and so I show it in that particular track. But it's not limited to parables in the strict sense of the term. Um, it's also um, it's also applicable to um, events and people within the Bible, because people each in the Bible have their own parabolic significance, and the things that they say, and the things that they do, and and who they are are all on some level parabolic. Um, there's always a higher aspect because again, one of the things about the Bible is it's the spiritual terms of God, the spiritual mysteries of God, the past, the present, the future, um, the higher things of God, all couched in the lower. And God is so brilliant, God is so intelligent, I almost think he can't help himself. He, he, he just crams everything he creates just full of wisdom, just full of truth. And people blind themselves to it through things like traditions and believing those who came before them or buying into assumptions that are fundamentally unsound. Like, I think it's an unsound assumption to believe that you cannot trust Jude when Jude is a prophetic and a biblical author, right? So if Jude is reading this book and you're not, for example, why is that? Why do you presume that Jude is wrong? I never made those presumptions. I never presumed that it was for no reason whatsoever that Peter wrote his letter around Jude. I never presumed that it was for no reason whatsoever that Jude quoted the book of Enoch. I, I reasoned it completely the other way around. There had to be a reason why he used these books. There had to be a reason why Peter wrote around Jude. And to think that if you think like Jude did, if you think like Peter did, that you could be going against the church and its teachings is very revealing to me. Um, but anyway, um, so at the time I was writing kind of these tracks just to get my thoughts out there, not really um, with any kind of game plan, not like trying to uh, disseminate this information too much, you know. Um, but it occurred to me that Peter represented the church um, when they're on their way to Caesarea Philippi Jesus asks his disciples who do men say that I am and um, they give him various answers such as your uh, Jeremiah or Elijah or one of the prophets come back to life and then 
Um, Jesus asks him, well, who do you say that I am? And then Simon Peter says, well, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answer him, answers him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter. So he gets his name Peter at that point. Um, he earns it. And upon this rock, because Peter, Petros, Petro means rock, um, I will build my church, right? So the name Peter and Simon is associated with the church at that point. And at some point I thought, maybe this is parabolic. And then I started going back and plugging some of this stuff in. And it finally came across the transfiguration, where, where Peter, James, and John all came up the mountain. And you'll find Peter, James, and John. Um, Paul calls them the pillars of the church, three pillars. Um, you'll find Peter, James, and John together a lot. Um, and anytime you do, it, uh, it, it's for some reason. Again, I never thought there was no reason for it. There always had to be some reason for it. You have to go and find out what that reason is. And um, so in my mind, I worked it out just like a, like a word problem almost like a scriptural algebra or something, Sudoku, I don't know, but just, it was, it was just, okay, if Peter represented the church, you see, because the picture was, they are on this mountain, James, Peter, and John, and Jesus is there with Moses and Elijah, right, knowing that Jesus had identified John the Baptist as Elijah, and he had spoken of him as the Elijah, which is, for to come, we know that John the Baptist is associated with Elijah, and that um, his function, of course, was to it was to point out to the people that um, that the Messiah was coming. He was there as a harbinger, as a forerunner uh, of Jesus, and again, his name was John. Um, and we also hear Jesus say that Elijah is to come and to set all things straight, or set all things right. Um, so, in other words, there's a, a future reference to John, or Elijah, um, that is to come. All right, so if Jesus, in a sense, represents the New Testament scriptures, and Peter represents the church, and we know that, for example, Jesus also said of John the Apostle, the beloved apostle, that um, he was to remain until his coming. See, that can be paired with Elijah, who is to come, right? John is to remain until my coming, and Elijah is to come. So the second pairing would be John and Elijah, that Elijah, um, the congregation, if you will, um, the testament, if you will, um, that corresponds to Elijah, also corresponds to John. And Moses, of course, had come prior to Jesus. So through process of elimination, you have Moses as being prior to Jesus and representing the Old Testament, the first revelation. Um, and then you see Jesus as coming next as representative of the New Testament, because the New Testament is centered around Jesus. And Elijah being to come and to set all things straight represents a sort of corrective testament. His function there is to set all things straight, right? To clear things up. So that, by process of elimination, Moses, um, who symbolizes the old covenant, right? The covenant of the law, if you will, um, is prior to Jesus. And so by process of elimination, that leaves James. So James must correspond in this particular picture, in this particular image, in this particular parable with Moses. James represents Moses, um, or corresponds with Moses. Peter corresponds with Jesus and the church. And the New Testament, of course, is the testament basically given to the church. And that John and Elijah correspond with each other as well. So anyway, um, so I went through the New Testament. Basically, every time there was a picture of Peter, James, and John together in the New Testament, um, I kind of went through it, and I wrote some of them down, 
kind of explaining that um, in, on the parabolic level, and I put it in this track. And then, just to show that this wasn't some weird fluke on my part, um, I was reading a book called The Secret Book of James. And here, you, if you keep in mind that James represents the Jews here, and Peter represents the church, this particular book is addressed essentially um, to James and to Peter, the Jews and the Christians. And it's a very scathing, in a sense, book um, directed against the Christians and the Jews. And it's all about the people who are to come. In other words, the Elijah people, the John people, it's all about them. And so I realized that this particular information actually decoded uh, an apocryphal book so that the, 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 the presumptions that were behind this, which was the canonical gospels, also held in this book that was rejected. And so it explained it in exactly the same way. Um, but it wasn't directed against John. John wasn't there. So John must have been right, you see. So in other words, just as Elijah came to set all things right, you see what I'm saying? He didn't need to be chastised. He was the one that was spoken of in the secret book of James. So anyway, um, and then that got me to thinking, too, because just as I had collated information in Second Peter and Jude and come out with a third hypothetical text. And just as I had taken the, the three sections of Enoch that I used to create a vision of the black hole, right? Um, I was reading out of um, the lost books of the Bible and I was trying to read the Protovangelion. I was trying to read the birth of Mary. I was trying to read all the um, infancy gospels and put them together and make some sense out of them. And uh, it was hard for me to do this, so I thought, well, I'll just do the same thing. I'll take and I'll copy these books, and then I'll take them and I'll cut them out. You just cut and paste. Just do a real simple sort of, you know, um, I don't know, just to see if it worked. Just to see. I mean, I did this for my own sake. And so you can see how, just not that you could read this, but you can see how, like, for example, you know, this is out of one book, this is out of another book, this down here is out of another book still, and you can see there's darker parts here and lighter parts there and so on and so forth. So you can kind of see where I had taken all of this material and collated it. And, you know, it's just page after page after page of the same stuff. And after I had gotten through putting all of this stuff together, you know, I realized that, you know, with a few little parenthetical ands, a few little parenthetical ors, a few little parenthetical buts, if you will, um, that this whole thing could basically come together to form a single larger gospel. And so I started thinking, well, what are the implications of this, right? Because it did basically fit from beginning to end. Because I went all the way from the infancy gospels, all the way through the ministry gospel, all the way through the passion narrative, all the way through the post-passion stuff. And it all could be made to fit together. And so I wrote a little treatise about that called What is the Gospel? Wherein, and you can kind of see the symbolism here, you know, the four, um, the four fish, the four gospels all form the large fish, like you see in the Gospel of Thomas. And all these little fish would be all the 80 or 90 other gospels that went into it. And so, thus began the super gospel. So, I spent probably about the next five or six years um, typing it out and fleshing it out, finding more and more sources, and going through and adding and correcting and moving and just trying to sort of massage it. And I did this over and over and over again. And I did all of these. All of these things are basically different redactions, just trying to make it more readable, more presentable, and more accurate. And um, I used the time that I had at work to listen to it 
and to try to make it more listenable and make it a little more reasonable. And I made all of these corrections while I was at work, just page after page after page of corrections, you know, until I ended up with just stacks of these things. And I ended up with basically a whole shoebox full of these things. And this represents just years and years of work. And um, so finally, um, I decided to make it available for others to read. I never presented it as something authoritative, like as if it were the gospel of Robert Farrell or whatever, but just because I had gone through the trouble of doing it, I found it was very interesting. I found it was very revealing, and other people wanted me to put it out. Now, it hasn't been very popular up to this point. It is available if you choose to buy it. I know I give it away as a free PDF, but I get about one or two requests for it a month. So I can't really even give it away. But it basically is the fruits of many, many years of intensive effort. Um, and, I, and I can't even begin to tell you. I, I, it's years and years and years of just focusing on this. And anyway, like I said, uh, a gentleman named Joseph Lumpkin was, was very kind. And uh, he saw the potential in this book. Um, and it hasn't, it hasn't borne its fruit just yet, but I imagine someday it will. Now, this book, um, years ago, I had an agent um, who was trying. I think she was trying to sell this book. I know she sold it. She tried it. She presented it to Doubleday and a few other uh, publishers. And every single one of them rejected this book. Out of hand, basically, because of the offensive apocryphal material that was in it. So these people obviously didn't get the point of the book at all. Um, they weren't willing to stick their necks out. Basically, I wouldn't say it was cowardice, but they just weren't willing to put their reputation on the line uh, for the likes of a book like this. And um, unfortunately, I sell maybe one or two of these books a month. It's not a big sell, um, and I don't imagine it would be, um, but it is, a, it is a big truth. Um, but truth doesn't really sell. Truth isn't very appealing to most people. Most people don't really care about truth, um, not even Christians. I, I can't tell you the number of Christians that I've shown these things to, and I never hear back from them again. They just aren't interested in the truth. I, I can show it to them in Jude. I can show it to them in the Bible. I could show them, for example, how in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, Paul uses the imagery of the armor of God. And this is a very famous, famous imagery, um, a very famous section. Um, and he borrows this imagery from the wisdom of Solomon. But you tell most Christians, of course, especially the Protestant Christians, they don't care. It doesn't, it doesn't matter to them all right, that something is true. The only thing that matters to them is it goes against their teaching. And this is basically what my channel is, is about. My channel is basically to bring to you things that no one else will bring to you. To bring you ideas and a perspective that no one else will bring to you and ostensibly very few people have. Now, I have chosen to side with the apostles. I've chosen to side with Paul against the Protestant church because of his usage of the wisdom of Solomon and because they have rejected it. Um, God says, Paul says, God says, let God be true in every man a liar. And I have lived that. Uh, not that I not that I disdain my fellow man, but it has been my observation that I cannot trust their judgment or their assessments because they do prove to be false. And no matter how much support they have, no matter what their numbers are, right? When God says, "Let him be true," and every man a liar, um, that's a hint. That should be telling you something, that people will lie to you and that people will, you know, misunderstand the truth. Uh, and it's up to you 
to try and find it. The Bible says, seek and ye shall find. Not just listen to other people and sit in the pew and you will find. It doesn't say that, right? Knock and the door will be open unto you. Not that you should just sit there and wait for the door to open, right? The Bible says, ask and it shall be given unto you. Not to uh, just sort of take what you're given. So, in other words, you have to sort of feed yourself. You have to sort of uh, get up and work with the word and try and discover its meaning if you're going to get anywhere with it. Now, I've taken all of these years of, uh, of learning and study and listening and uh, observation, and I believe very much that I have had God's help along the way. Uh, not that I consider myself to be infallible. I'm extremely fallible as a human being. Uh, I'm not the most educated person in the world. It, you know, most of what I know, I just know out of instinct, out of a gut feeling, out of something I couldn't possibly explain to people. Um, but there's nothing special about me. The, it's, it's all about the scriptures and the Bible and the people who basically fought and died to preserve these truths. The early Christians knew these truths. They lived these truths. They believed these things. And we read over and over and over again how these people have infiltrated the church. They were infiltrating the church from the very beginning, subverting the truth from the very beginning. John says that even now there are many antichrists. John, you read in his third letter, was not even allowed into the church of Diotrephes. Now here was an apostle of Jesus, a beloved apostle of Jesus, and very early on in the church age, he was rejected while he was alive. Paul speaks of this all the time, that people abandon him. All right. So it's no great wonder to think that while these people are still alive, Jesus even said it himself, you know, if they treat me this way while the tree is still green, what about when it's withered up? Again, this is, this is a picture of just how people are going to treat the prophets and the apostles and the word of God. The question is, have they done it? My answer is they have done it and they continue to do it. And when you bring these things to them and before them and you watch how they stand up for tradition and they slap Jude in the face and they slap Peter in the face and they slap Paul in the face and say, you know what? I don't care what you say. I don't care that this was your position. I don't care that this is what you taught. I am going to stick with men and their teaching. And you'd be very surprised at what you find. Because you'll find that people will do this over and over and over again. Especially the ones who are most devout in their, in their religion. Especially the people in the pulpits will do this. They have a stake in the past. They have a stake in their tradition. They have a stake in what has gone before and what they have said. And why would they walk away from all that they've had and all that they've said? Why would they humble themselves? Why would they uh, stick their necks out uh, when they perceive that they don't have to? But you see, the truth will come out because Elijah sets things right. The Bible says that in the day of the harvest, we should be praying for workers in the field. I hope that those of you who are serious enough about truth to put all this uh, tradition behind you and set out um, in search of genuine biblical truth, who really, really want to get at the heart of what is being said by the scriptures and to kind of understand the length and the width and the height and the depth of God's word. Um, I invite you to explore my channel. There are a great many things on this channel that if you look at them, and, and some of the most amazing things that I have discovered are some of the things with the lowest view counts. If you go through my channel, don't just look at the stuff that everyone else has looked at. Go looking for things that people haven't looked at. Um, I have some old videos of myself from way back in 2000, 2001, um, that people hardly ever look at, um, that I think contain some really worthwhile information. 
um, my Understanding Paul series, which I put on a playlist, um, I think. It's very long and it's very detailed, but if you're the kind of person who's really seeking to understand Paul, there's some very eye-opening things in that uh, in that uh, in that particular um, playlist. And um, basically, um, I've got all kinds of books. Um, pseudepigraphal and apocryphal writings that I've put up for you to explore so that you don't have to go through the trouble of reading them yourself. Uh, and I'll continue to upload those as I get the chance, but uh, as you recall, I have lots and lots and lots of tapes to convert. Uh, again, I wrote them for my own sake. They, uh, they're they a little less than professional. Uh, but again, I'm, everything I do, I just do for myself, for my own study for my own gain and I make them available to you. I don't demand involvement from people. I don't ask for money or help. It's nice if you want to help, but you know, this is all about the truth and this is all about you. God's got a plan for you. God wants you to learn and to find your own way in life and then to help others learn and find God in their lives. So I invite you to subscribe and to rate and to share. None of this stuff is going to uh, is going to really break through uh, unless we share. Um, that just at some point has got to happen. I have, as it stands now, I have something like 2,000 subscribers, but I have been on YouTube for almost four years now. Uh, so that amounts to maybe one or two subscribers a day. It's all basically cumulative. Um, I'm not where I need to be. Um, I know my videos have very little production value. I certainly am not on the level of, oh, I don't know, say Fred or Sexy Phil or anything like that. You know, but again, that just lets you know what people focus on and what, they are, what they're interested in. They're, it's a filtering process. People who seek truth are always going to be very few in number. Um, people who don't care about truth, people who... Um, who uh, just say what everybody else says and does what everybody else does and everything. Those people are the ones who, um, you know, people who cater to the world or whatever. Those are the people who are going to be successful. That's where the numbers are going to be. Um, but, you know, the Bible does tell us that we will be able to speed the Lord's coming. It's going to take the effort of people who really want these truths to be promulgated, to make videos of their own, or to share the videos of other people who have uh, who uh, believe these things, because that's the only way it's ever going to happen. Um, I'm going to be praying for um, people, workers, uh, to go into the harvest and to bring these things about. But this is the way of the future. It is going to happen. People will come to find out these truths sooner or later, and we have the power to make it sooner rather than later. Um, so I appeal to you, if you really, really understand and appreciate these things, to share them or to make videos of your own that, uh, that, that show things that have been revealed to you that are uh, along these lines that do back up what the apostles and the writers of the New Testament were saying. Um, because there's plenty of truth out there. I may only be scratching the surface. Um, there, there are many mysteries to be found. I mean, this is a feast, if you will, of God's word. This is a, um, a revelation, if you will, of God's truth. A truth that has been with us all this time. That, um, that anyone at any time, for any reason, could have come across had they been at least halfway honest with themselves and with others and had some level of integrity. And it doesn't take much to believe the writers of the New Testament. It only takes the faith of a mustard seed to say that Jude is right and people are wrong. It only takes that level of faith to admit that, um, that Paul got his sources largely from sources that we rejected. All you have to do is look, and all you have to do is proclaim it as the truth, because it is the truth. And to think for 2,000 years, people have not been willing to just give that one little 
tiny bit of faith, you know, that one little bit that would change everything, right? Because people just are not that way, unfortunately. This has been a very wicked and dark age, full of wars and full of divisions and full of hatred and full of strife and envying. And James tells us that this is not a godly spirit. It is not the good and perfect thing which comes from above, but it is worldly and earthly and devilish. We should never, ever, ever negate the New Testament prophets. That is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, because it is the Holy Spirit that inspired the prophets. And you think about the punishment that we are under, because that is the unforgivable sin. And we have committed it. We commit it to this day. And you watch as people commit it again when you bring these things to them. When you tell your pastors, when you share these things with Christian people that you know, they will still reject them. Um, and it's sad. It really is sad because these are the people we stand in the way of God's coming to us. If we have the power to speed his coming, as it says in Second Peter, then it's only logical to think that we also have the power to delay it. And this is what we have done. We have played into the devil's hands for these last 2,000 years and have delayed the Lord's coming. Um, and that's a shame. And people will continue to delay it. Um, but if you're an honest, sincere Christian, you will do what you can to help speed it. So if you're one of those types of people, then I wish you God's speed. Thank you very much.